Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second webinar in our health equity series. Really excited to have you here today. We'll be getting started in just a moment. We have a lot of folks registered for this session today, so we're going to give them a moment to log on. If you want to jump into the chat room, tell us where you are logging in from. We would love to know where you are in the country. Are you in the country? Are you in Canada? Um, give us a sense of where you are. So um, jump on in the chat room for us and show us. That would be great. And hopefully, Emma, we've enabled the chat for everybody. <laughs> Justin. Here we go, Chicago. Welcome, <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri, Boulder. OK. Um, and our uh, presenters here today. Um, Elia, why don't you tell us where you're logging in from? Oh, you're on mute, so you got to unmute. Logging in from the Smoky Mountains, North Carolina. All right. If we have any North Carolina folks, please <laughs> let us know. We've got a neighbor. And Will Gordon, where are you logging in from today? I'm just outside Boston, Massachusetts and Newton, Massachusetts. Great. Any New Englanders there? Let's uh, see it. We'd love to know. Connecticut, Boston. There you go. And Mike Curry, where are you logging in from? Maryland, the great state of Maryland. Perfect. All right. Any of our uh, mid-Atlantic folks? I'm in Maryland also. Love to see our folks here. And Kevin Larson, how about you? I'm here in downtown Washington, D.C. Wonderful. Okay, so we got a couple of folks inside the Beltway today. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see you. We have a very large group, so we're going to give them just another moment to log in. We want to make sure everybody is here today. Welcome. We've got a great session. Um, we do have that Q&A box there at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions as we go through the session today, I want to encourage you to put them in that Q&A box. Um, questions that go into the chat might get missed, but um, put your questions um, into the Q&A box at the bottom and, and we'll make sure we get to them um, later. Uh, welcome. All right, Milwaukee, Kentucky, Ohio, Charlotte, North Carolina, welcome. Stephen Thomas, great to see you here today. Welcome. All right, let us know where you're logging in from. If you're um, in country, out of country, um, we'd love to hear it. If you want to share the names of your organizations as well, that's wonderful. Um, great to have everybody here today. We want to have a really active chat session here. So let us know as we're going through the presentation today, um, any comments or questions or thoughts that you have. Um, I am Jen kovic bordnick I am the CEO of EHI, Executives for Health Innovation, and we have a wonderful program for you today. We're going to be talking about avoiding unintended bias and how to responsibly use AI and machine learning to address health disparities. This is the sec second program in a webinar series looking at health disparities, um, which is sponsored by United Health Group and EHI, and we're really excited to have you here today, an incredible group of panelists. Emma, my partner in crime here, if you can help me run through a couple of quick introductory slides while the rest of folks are joining us. Again, I am with EHI, Executives for Health Innovation. If you're not familiar with us, we're a small nonprofit in Washington, D.C., focused on healthcare transformation, so convening executives across the industry. Next slide. So we do collaborative learning, shaping policy and thought leadership. Next slide. And we focus on a couple of core areas. So patient experience, health equity and access, digital care and privacy and security. So this session that we're talking about today clearly um, is in line with our health equity and access um, focus area. And we know a lot of you are very interested in this. We really believe we need to create an environment where everybody has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Next slide. And this is a list of some of the executives that are involved um, in our organization, or rather the companies that they're from. If you don't see the name of your company listed there and you would like to get involved in our programming and sessions, we would love to hear from you. So go ahead and um, chat with me in the box and, and we will get back to you after today's session if you would like to join us. Next slide. All right, just a little background on EHI, our, our 20 year anniversary last year. Next slide. And a couple of um, things we'd love for you to take a look at that are relevant to the program today. We've got a great blog right now on health equity, um, how it's time for bold thinking and a focus shift to the upstream drivers. And we'll send out actually a link to that. We've also got a fantastic report we just released recently about addressing inequity in cancer care, which involves a number of oncologists, 
um, and different experts providing care across the nation. So great, great um, report if you're interested in that. And then the first webinar from the series is also there and, and we'll send out a link to that as well. If you're interested in continuing EDU credits, um, this is how you do it. There is a, there you go, QR code right on the screen. You can click on that. Um, we will also be sending this information out after the session today. Um, and um, a recording will also be available so you can share it. Next slide. Okay, and again, I do want to thank um, United Health Group. We are a very small nonprofit in DC and, and we really rely upon the generosity of groups um, like UHG. Um, to support the educational programming that we do. So a big thanks to them, and particularly to Mike Curry, who I'm going to introduce, um, who is the Senior VP and Chief Health, Health Equity Officer at United Health Group. Um, Mike leads the health equity efforts in addressing identified disparities across United Health Group since June of 2010. He's been in this business for 30 years, looking at population health management, has worked in both the public and private sectors, um, also worked with the state of Maryland, my own wonderful state, um, working with the Cancer Registry and the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So an incredible background. Mike is actually going to moderate this session today and introduce our incredible uh, prestigious panel that we have. So I'm gonna actually turn it over to Mike and I will see you again at the end of the program. So Mike. Welcome. Great, thank you, Jen. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this really powerful session where we have um, invited guests that are really going to help you do three things. Learn, think about how to integrate what you do um, or integrate these principles and ideas and thoughts that are gonna be shared today in what you do. And the third thing is drive innovative thinking. So maybe things you haven't thought of, it's going to inspire some new thoughts and ideas um, that will take root and take action in the work that's being done. Let's go on and get started and have our panelists introduce themselves. And we'll start ladies first. So Elia, would you please start us with your uh, introduction? with some sure. introductory remarks about yourself. Sure, I'm a physician informaticist. I'm also director of data science and clinical analytics health over at Elsevier. And I lead a team of localization experts, data scientists, clinicians, including nurses and, and physicians as well. And I'm very happy to be here today. Very good, thank you, thank you. Um, Will, you next. Fantastic. Thank you. So my name is uh, Will Gordon. Um, I'm also a physician informaticist with the esteem today, um, and I am a medical officer and senior advisor for data and technology at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Um, I joined CMS in January. Prior to that, I was uh, faculty and staff at the Mass General Brigham Healthcare System in Boston um, and led a variety of uh, technology, data, interoperability uh, programs here. So really excited to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Will. Kevin. Uh, Kevin Larson. Uh, I too am a physician informaticist and I lead a group of clinical informaticists here at uh, Optum building clinical decision support. Uh, I also lead an innovation team that is using uh, clinical data to do uh, machine learning and, um, uh, and work to figure out how we can um, empower providers to use that machine learning insights uh, in, in clinical care. Um, before this, I came from where Will was. I was previously uh, at HHS, both at CMS and ONC. Thank you. Thank you very much, each of you, for providing some introductions and some background on yourselves. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we, uh, we're going to have discussion with these panelists that have deep, deep knowledge and understanding how to protect against bias in all things health data and health data analytics related. So we're gonna get started uh, with some scripted questions for each of the panelists, and then we'll move to some open-ended questions as well as uh, any questions that you all may have that you send through via the chat. So Elia, we'll, we'll start with you. We'll start mm -hmm. with you. Um, well, actually, Kevin, we're gonna start with you. First question will be for you, Kevin. Kevin, when we talk about this, 
this work around unintentional bias, it all stems from the art of the possible associated with AI and ML, so artificial intelligence and machine learning. So can you get us started, Kevin, with a grounding on what the promise is, what the art of the possible is mm -hmm. associated with AI and ML? Yeah, so um, I've been lucky to be schooled in some of the uh, AI ML best practices from really terrific data scientists. I, I don't pretend to be an expert, but have gotten to learn from a lot of people with a lot of expertise. Um, part of what I learned is that the my training in how to do uh, research, how to do data research, and how to think about things like regression models and confounders uh, was really applicable from the my world in in um, as a researcher and as a critical reviewer of the medical literature into my world in AI and ML. So in some ways, what we've done with um, machine learning is to take the same kind of models we do for uh, to study research uh, you know, in, a, in a clinical trial, but we can do hundreds or hundreds of thousands of those experiments in the data. But it's in many cases, the exact same kind of experiment with the exact same kind of thinking around confounders and the same kind of thinking about what, what, is, the, what is the applicability of this. So um, uh, that we are still learning and exploring what this means in the, in the space of medicine and, and how to keep it safe and reliable. The promise uh, is, uh, I think, like uh, computer-assisted flying or computer-assisted driving. If, if you think about a modern airplane, that modern airplane needs a computer computer in order to keep its wings stabilized, in order to help it land, in order to really make it function and be very safe. However, there's still a pilot and a co-pilot and a crew that, that runs that. So my, my thinking about uh, AI and machine learning in healthcare is that we can eventually get to a place where we have the same kind of sophistication supporting doctors, nurses, patients in keeping them safe, keeping them reliable, that we have to help land airplanes and that we have to help keep them safe in the air. So I don't think of this as a replacing of human being activity. I think that this is a supporting and augmenting with a very powerful tool. And that powerful tool is taking the kinds of research, the kinds of math that we've done for many years, and it can do it much faster with a lot more data and a lot more um, inputs. I like to think of it uh, ultimately like I, I would love to empower doctors to have the medical version of a self-driving car, uh, but we're not going to get to a self-driving car instantly. We're going to first have lane assist and we're going to have backup assist and we're going to have a little bit of signaling here and there that helps us learn and get comfortable and figure out how we're still in control and understand what these new additions are. God, very helpful. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, the analogy of the self-driving car, that puts it in good context for me. Um, Elia, coming to you with the next question. So obviously, Kevin has talked about um, what is behind AI and ML and it's data. And with that data, math happens and the algorithms do what they do. But we all know that you know bad data in, kind of bad data or activities associated with the data coming out. So Elliot, help us with what does a biased data set look like versus what an unbiased data set looks like? How do you set the deep learning algorithm up for success with good unbiased data? Great question. So in my opinion, I think this really starts at making sure that there's proper governance in place. If we're thinking about data science and having a really strong data science governance, best practices, um, rules, regulations, if we're looking at our different learning, deep learning models, looking at model cards, data cards, how do we specify limitations, the benefits, um, anything that's gonna be specific about a model and also capturing all the different elements and features that go into those those um those those 
ask th those points that actually make that could be included in the bias. So a biased data set is going to be a bit. It's going to be biased. It's going to be. It could be homogenous. It doesn't include diversity in um, perspectives, in feature selection, in all these different traits, and as a result, it can give an inappropriate output. So an inappropriate prediction. So this is why whenever we're creating, in order to set our our training sets and our models up for success, it's important to make sure that we're docu documenting everything well, that there is a control system in place that we're providing that quality assurance um, to standards, uh, whether it's data science standards or also clinical standards. And um, yeah, that's what I believe. Sorry, my throat's a bit dry. <laughs> No words. But Mike, can I chime in there a little bit? Absolutely. Please do, Kevin. So so I think that every data set is going to have a bias, and that's what's important to know. We don't have data about everything, everywhere, and all the people and all of the, the factors we want. So the first thing is to say that this data set is going to be fit for some particular purpose, but it's going to exclude people. So for example, if I'm studying children, I'm not going to use the Medicare data set that's mostly people over age 65 it's going to be biased because it just doesn't have kids in it. And to constantly be thinking about that as we're looking at data sets, um, uh, what is it that we know about the data that we have and what is it we care about? And does the data that we have contain those people is the first question. And then the second question, if it contains those people, does the data differentiate them in a way that the machine, that the machine can tell? Um, you know, if, if we don't have ages in the system, the machine might not be able to tell who's a kid and who's an adult. So um, you have to have some understanding. I think of it like a table one from a research project, uh, a research paper. Who's here? What's the population? Who are we actually looking at? Very, very helpful. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I just saw in the chat come through. There are various forms of bias. Um, and they just came through in the chat, so I, I won't be redundant on them. Will, when I look at the information that came through in the chat in these various forms of bias, do you protect against that with this notion of an inclusive data set? We've seen the term, have your data set be inclusive. Does that solve for bias or at least one portion or aspect of bias? Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I, I kind of agree with the conversation so far. It, it's it's not as simple as to have an inclusive data set, collect inclusive data, right? It wouldn't be great if it were that easy, just an easy button. Um, and I think that it's it's actually really hard to get that data, to collect that data. I, I tend to think of this in two buckets. The first is population level issues. Uh, so I think about things like methodology, how are we being deliberate about data collection at the practice level, at the provider level? Um, making sure that we're being representative, being thoughtful about the questionnaires you're using, what are the actual toolings you're using to ask questions, if this data is coming from patient reported data, which often it is, um, being systematic using validated questionnaires if they exist, um, and they, they're not actually, there aren't that many validated questionnaires that, that collect um, this type of data, looking at standard operating procedures, et cetera. so kind of the population level issues, and then patient level issues, which are kind of on the ground, how do you actually manage um, the, the data collection when the patient's in, in the mix, which they hopefully usually are, uh, although not always if you're looking at administrative data. Um, and I think I think really important to, to a couple of things I wanna highlight here, and some of this may be no, I think obvious to some folks, but just wanna make sure it, it put it out there. There's a huge trust aspect to this data and collecting this data. Um, and, and you know, just imagine that you're going to your primary care doctor for your annual visit or a blood pressure check or a cough or whatever it may be. And you get asked by the provider, the doctor, the medical assistant, or even like on an iPad in the waiting room or a questionnaire, are you having trouble paying your utility bills? Are you um, uh, experiencing homelessness? Um, what, you know, what's your sexual identity, um, your race, ethnicity, your migrant status sometimes in some, in some questionnaires based on in geography. That's a that's a heavy set of questions to ask somebody in a provider office that's not there to answer those questions necessarily and may not have made the leap for why that's important to their overall health. I think there's a huge trust aspect of getting this data and can totally understand. I think it's obvious why patients may not want to answer those questions. And then, and then you don't have an inclusive data set because the, the folks that 
may have positive findings for those questions aren't going to answer them because of they're worried about um, the security, the privacy, the implications from a legal perspective of answering them. Um, and the second, I think, second thing I think worth pointing out is that there is, you know, I think that the digital divide is obviously very well documented, in, you know, for decades. Um, it, it's definitely getting more narrow, but still exists. And I think if you're if you're collecting this data, asking patients, and you're doing it based on an iPhone app or an Apple app or an, an Android app, you're going to necessarily exclude folks that don't have a smartphone. And so really meeting patients where they are, being able to track folks down in the community, if you need to call them wherever they are to get that, to really be as inclusive as possible. Um, I think there are technical approaches here worth mentioning. You know, folks talk about imputation, representative sampling to really make sure you're as inclusive as possible. And Haynes is a good example of a national representative data set um, that's been around for you know decades now. Um, there's obviously error around the margins there when you use computational methods to get this data, but it is you know, they can be helpful sometimes if, if you really can't get an inclusive data set. But I think it's it's complicated, right? And, and it requires a lot of effort to, to make sure you get there. Uh, th thank you. Very thorough. Thank you. Appreciate that, Will. You know, Elliot, let me, let me follow back up with you. Mm -hmm. So in part of Will's response, he, would, he used the term patients and this collection of data via patients or uh, um, EHR and other data sets that are associated with patients. So I, I don't want to leave it up to assumption. I want us to be very clear. When using biased data sets in AI and, and ML, what kind of impact, Elliot, does that have on patient care and health outcomes? Direct impacts, and it really makes the problems worse. It perpetuates any of the margins that already exist. I'll give you an example. Like in many cases, when looking at how, how often are women versus males given x-rays or any sort of radi radiation imaging, right? Um, it has been shown in many studies that women are less exposed or less given these types of workups, and especially women that are in childbearing age. It could be that some of the hypotheses are because they don't want, the practitioner doesn't want to expose their patients to um, radiation, right, of the unborn, the unborn infant. And so um, by, having, um, by having these limitations from the bat, like it, it really causes cases where people aren't diagnosed in time and where medical error can be made, essentially. Yeah, yeah but harm, medical errors, absolutely, absolutely. So with that in mind, Will, I'll come to you. With that in mind, if we know that using biased data has poor outcomes associated with it and it impacts patients. So we want to make sure it's right. We want to make sure it's used appropriately for all of the appropriate intended uses. What do you see, Will, as the biggest challenge of using AI and ML specifically to improve patient health outcomes? This is, this is um, I suspect that uh, Kevin, Ellie, and I could riff on the challenges here for probably about seven more hours, um, as well as other folks uh, in, uh, on, on the webinar. Um, so it's a great question. And I, I think um, I would say that I, I maybe start with what the challenge is not. The challenge is not technical. I think that the technical abilities that we have today in the machine learning data science community, I think far exceed any of the other complexities around using AI to improve health outcomes. And an example of that are the amazing developments in large language models and generative AI that we've seen in the last six months, ChatGPT 3, 3.54, that I think um, the technical abilities really are there. And I, I almost never see a technical challenge with, with this. It's really um, like the, you know, the people, the process side of things. Um, the, uh, there's, so many, there's so many challenges. So, where is so I, I would say one area in particular, maybe this is in my, my bias as a provider who's worked heavy, heavily on the implementation side of things in my career. I think the implementation layer is a, is a big challenge. Um, assuming you can get unbiased data, or, or maybe that's impossible, but minimally biased data, minimally unbiased models, 
you can update these models over time in a minimally biased way. Again, these are huge challenges in and of themselves. How do you actually integrate that into a workflow in a way that is not interruptive, but still beneficial? Providers understand it. It's explainable. They get they gather trust in it. They understand it. How do you monitor it over time? If it's patient facing, kind of same, same questions. I think that there's a lot of work to do on the implementation layer of actually taking, again, assuming you're getting unbiased data or minimally biased data, which is a huge assumption. And I think we're not there yet either. Actually doing the implementation, I think is a, is a major, major area that we need to focus on. And again, the challenge is not, I don't think it's technical at this point. I think it's really, it's the, the interaction with the people and the tooling that is gonna make it uh, most successful. No, Elia, any, anything you wanna to add to that as it relates yeah. to challenges? Um, not really to add to I was looking at some of the questions in the chat and about to add to that, but um, yeah, no, sorry. You had um, a question, we can rephrase that and then I'll answer to it, Will. Yeah, uh, please, if there was a question that came in that related to challenges, please, by all means, chime in. Okay, yeah, no, I was just looking at just how do we standardize the data itself? So I was just gonna add that there are different techniques that we can do to help with the normalization. We can help add structure to unstructured content by aligning with vocabularies, whether there's an internal or external ontology taxonomy. We can also align that with different value sets, um, reference terminologies such as SNOMA TT, ICD-10, um, ICD-11 now, <laughs> RX norm and all these other vocabularies. And this could definitely help add some structure into the data sets. Thank That's you. what I was typing. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. It, Ke Kevin, before I come to you with a different question, anything to add as it relates to challenges associated with yeah. specifically using this to improve health outcome, not just doing um, data analytics so we yeah. can learn information. It, that part, I think folks understand, but specifically using it as part yeah. of improving care delivery and, and improving health outcomes. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. The first is um, I started my career doing health services research and health equity. And part of what I realized is most of that was done on people who had insurance and people who were in care. And there is a whole lot of Americans who don't have insurance and a whole lot of Americans who aren't regularly in care. And so as I thought about where is the missing data to understand health outcomes, that's where it's missing because I actually just didn't have a data source for that. I had to like try to figure out where that would be. So to always be thinking about, if I'm looking at this, who didn't come to the doctor? We know that men come less than women, for example. So you're, you're likely going to have more women because they have more utilization in your data set than you're going to have men because they just, they might have the same burden of disease. They don't come to the doctor. So that's one thing. The second is to really think through the difference between bias and fairness. And this is like the difference between discrimination and equity. Um, so bias means that it, it kind of is like a disparity that, that, that the, the system is that, that somehow the data is wrong or upset. But often what we're trying to achieve is equity. We're trying to give people an equal chance. Uh, and that's where fairness comes into play, which can be different than actually bias. So an example from the non-healthcare literature if you do a machine learning model on who a bank should give a mortgage to, the, they will look at historical data from the last 30 or 40 years and look at historical income. And they'll say, we should preferentially give loans to white people because they have higher incomes and they have more of a credit history and they have more net worth. And it will the model will just reinforce what the culture has always done. But as people have looked at that, they say that doesn't feel very fair. The, the data set might be unbiased. You might have equal number of blacks and whites in the data set, but the, the recommendation might not feel like a fair recommendation. So how do you also think about fairness in the context of this, not just think about bias? Uh, very helpful. I, I think about the differentiation between equality and equity and why there's a focus on equity. Equality yeah. is giving everyone the same thing, the analogy, Kevin knows this very well. I use the analogy of bicycles. And if your focus is to go from health status point A to health status point B, under the framework of equality, everyone will get the same size, same brand, same speed bicycle. But we know individuals are of differing abilities, ages, sizes, genders, 
And that's where equity comes in because then you mm -hmm. receive a bicycle, you are provided a bicycle that's specific to your unique needs. Um, mm -hmm. So it sounds very similar, Kevin. So Kevin, based on all this that we talked about, wanting to remove as much bias as possible, as Will has said, we want to use um, a minimal, minimally biased data set because it's kind of virtually impossible to take all bias out. So as we use these minimally biased data sets, Kevin, how do we measure progress over time? How do we know what good looks like? That's a terrific question. And I, I think it has to be multimodal. Right. I think uh, I totally agree with Elia. We need um, governance, but I also think we need um, transparency and we need to crowdsource uh, the, our kind of culture because we can often get insular. We can get a bunch of informaticists together and we all believe in one way, but ideally we should broaden the tent, bring in other people and actually say, hey, we're about to do this. Hey, patient, what do you think of this? Does this make sense? Hey, equity expert, what do you think? Does this make sense? Um, hey, data scientists, you really understand how the statistics and math here work. Does this make sense? How do we bring in multiple perspectives in a consistent kind of stage gateway and say, yep, it, I think of it kind of like an IRB, an institutional review board. How do we have multiple people looking at this from different perspectives to say, okay, we feel comfortable with this and have that not just a once and done thing, but an ongoing review and an ongoing way that we commit and we get better collectively because none of us know the answer to this. There's not one company or one person or one, one discipline that actually can, can fully solve this. We're going to have to do this together and we're going to have to do it with multiple, multiple um, types of expertise. Well, well how about you? you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Was saying, Sorry, yeah. no, I was just going to chime in. I definitely agree with Kevin. Um, over at Elsevier, for example, we, we have different governance boards and different frameworks, maybe looking at the same problem, but with a different lens and brushstroke. So mm -hmm. it, it just it definitely helps having the different opinions, different eyes, and then tackling the same problem. So, yeah. yeah you, you just made me think, Ellie, about um, the importance of diversity. And the importance of diversity is not so that you have individuals of different hues sitting in a room and engaged in a discussion. It's because it brings a, a, a difference and a variation of thought and perspectives to mm -hmm. whatever the discussion is that's being had. You know, well, kind of same question for you. Uh, I'd love for you to chime in here. When you think about your lens from a CMS perspective, how, how do you measure progress? What does good look like? How do you advise and counsel from a CMS perspective, all of those working in this space to do the right work and, and do it, at, to use Kevin's word, fairly and appropriately? Yeah, it's, so it's hard, it's, uh, I mean, it's a theme of what I'm saying, it's hard. Um, so, you know, very quickly, so I, I work for, um, CMMI, which is a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, one of the six CMS centers. Our charge, established by the Affordable Care Act, is to pilot and test new models of care delivery, new payment models um, in the U.S. population, um, evaluate them, and if they either statutorily reduce cost or improve quality or a cost neutral and quality neutral, they can then graduate to CMS. So it's kind of like this incubation lab for new payment models. And one of our like deliberate strategies, is there was a strategy re refresh last year, 2021, um, it's public, it's online. One of the five main stra strategic pillars now is to advance health equity and to do that in everything we do. And as a result of that, what's happened is we're now, CMI is now going to start requiring, has already started, that all of our model participants, and this is primary care, specialty care, um, emergency services, et cetera, ACOs, they start collecting um, demographics, expanded demographics and social needs data for their patients. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the question of, is that going to be good enough? No, of course not. But you start somewhere um, and you start with asking and collecting. And I think the hope of what we can do as CMMI is if these models are successful, they get woven into the fabric of how CMS delivers care more broadly. And then again, becomes kind of standard of care. So it's not weird when you go to the doctor, they ask you these questions and because it become part of the expectation and there's education around why, why we're asking. Um, 
The other thing I'll note very quickly is that even in, for CMS, there's a, there's a ton of complexity around care delivery. Again, I think folks by many already know this, but there's certainly Medicare, you know, traditional fee-for-service Medicare, um, but there's also Medicare Advantage, which is growing in popularity is now about 50% of, of, of the Medicare population. There are the CMMI models. Um, there are ACO populations within Medicare. There are dual eligibles, folks that are eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. There's Medicaid, there's managed Medicaid, right? So you get into a lot of different flavors of how care is paid for by the government. And I think they're all nuanced in their own way around these, around these issues. And I think, again, like I think Kevin said multimodal, right? That's, it has to be multimodal. There's not going to be like a Python script that fixes this, right? It's, it's, it's multimodal. It's all engaging stakeholders really getting that, getting down to the, into the weeds of it and trying to figure it out. Just add also one key thing that Will said was education. So really providing that education and transparency really helps build that trust that will help enforce this and, and so that we can build those models that are successful and that are not marginalizing certain people. Very good, very good, thank you. Um, I want each of you to weigh in on a couple of additional questions that I have. And then we'll take a look at the chat and see what's come in via the chat. And Kevin, since you started of all, started us off with the response around fairness, um, I'd like to pose this one to you and then uh, Ellie and Will, you weigh in on it as well. So Kevin, considering, um, you know, there's a kind of standardized question, uh, not standardized, but it's a routine question associated with the fact that Many of the technology spaces um, are do not have many non-whites involved in the work. So considering that's the case, and we just talked about this diversity of thought, so considering that there is likely a lack of diversity of thought in those technology spaces, how can we reasonably expect AI to be culturally competent? That's a great question, Mike. And it's, you know, we have a lot of work to do, not just in AI, but we have a lot of work to do in general across the country in equity, right? Uh, you know that as well as I know that. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean we should stop. What it means is we should figure out how to bro open the tent, how to bring people in, and we should um, figure out how to collaborate. Uh, we've worked on some terrific models where we partner with, for example, community-based organizations and say, how do we iterate with a community group who historically hasn't had scientists or researchers there, but they direct questions and then we do iterative research back and forth with that group. Um, I think that can be a really powerful model and a really terrific way to say, um, this isn't just about a big corporation answering a question. This is about going to a community that has needs that wants to engage in research because that they often have lots of fantastic insights and questions and knowledge. How do we do that? How do we build that system and iterate back and forth? The other thing I think it's important to always remember is um, how culturally specific our thoughts about equity and fairness are. I, when I taught in the medical school, I would bring an article from Israel and the way they divided people in this article about colon cancer screening was Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardic Jews, Arabs, and other. And that was, they, they showed the disparities in, in, in Israel in those four categories. And I thought that's really interesting. Almost all of us in the US would be other. And we are trying to separate that community and we wouldn't have insight into the categories that they had that were important to Israel. So we have to remember that these are cultural constructions and cultural issues of equity and fairness. So we need that lens of kind of cultural expertise and then think about would that study from Israel have relevance here or not? Hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Ellie, anything you wanna to add to that? I think that's a really good um, bit of story that Kevin just brought up. I think that since we're thinking about culture, it's important to be culturally competent and what does that mean? Like really understanding the different cultures and even subcultures within cultures, <laughs> um, understanding those differences, similarities, and how we can help build out systems that are really adaptable to, to those different ethnicities. Yeah, yeah. And 
you know, when we think about cultural competency, especially when you think about data and being able to gather appropriate data, what you really want to understand and what you're trying to appreciate through the data are cultural norms that the data can hopefully take into account so that the math or the algorithm takes it into account when it does what it's designed to do. Um, Will, anything from you to add to that piece around the cultural competence or the lack thereof in this technology space and how we at least begin to solve for it? Yeah, I think I think echoing Elliot and Kevin, I think partnership collaboration is key. I really like that as an Israel example because it just demonstrates how people people's model of the world around them is is different. Um, and that that could be at the at the country level, it could be at the lo- location level, it could be at the zip code, the ADI level. I mean, there's a lot of different different ways to think about it. And so collaborating with groups, again, not going to be fixed by Python script, right? It needs needs collaboration, and kind of deep discussions, and some of those some of those conversations are going to be hard. Um, but I think that's it has to start there at least. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, empathy. Somebody put in the chat some empathy, some understanding and empathy. Um, one final question, then I'm going to go to the chat. Um, Elliot, from your perspective, what is, uh, we talked about challenges. So this is a little bit of a different question. What's the most difficult part for anyone in this space, a researcher, a technologist, anyone in this space? What is the hardest part, Elliot, about recognizing bias? Good question. (laughs) I think it could be stepping aside and realizing what biases that a person has. Like it could be that I'm biased against something. So I need to step aside and look at what my biases are and then put it in a container, (laughs) like kind of taking that um, objective view of everything, really doing one's best to classify things and identify different features that could be perceived potentially as a bias. Absolutely. Yeah. That's hard because that's looking inward to begin yeah. with. <laughs> outward to begin with. Yeah. That's a, Kevin, anything? That's Kevin or Will, anything to add there? I think uh, related, a similar thing. Some of the people that have given me the best gifts are to be clear and point out when I have a bias and tell me that because I don't see it, right? Even if I try, if I think I'm open, uh, I have to be told. And then when someone, someone does me the favor of telling me, I can then self-reflect in a, in a much deeper way and hope to learn. Love that. Yeah, that you don't, you don't know what you don't know. And, and I think that's exactly right. Conversation and transparency is key here um, to, to, really, to really just bring these things to the surface. Yeah, yeah somebody put in the chat, you know, that can be a difficult, conversation sometimes, but if we're going to do our best work, helping people understand and appreciate um, things that maybe they don't know. To your point, Will, it's it's a curryism that I use often. Well, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So uh, the only way you know is when somebody shares it with you and hopefully you have an open enough mind to receive what's been shared with you. Well, let's go to the chat. Let's see what kind of questions are coming in and Let's kind of fire these off. Um, Huh, so Kevin, let's start with you on this one. How do you think chat GPT (laughs) could impact bias, especially in clinical AI and ML? Yeah, we've been, as probably everyone else, uh, inundated with thinking about chat GPT and what it can do and what it can't do. Um, to my initial sort of discussion about every data set is biased, I have a, um, huge questions about what the data set is we're going to actually use to do anything about ChatGPT on. We are intentionally very protective of personal health information. I totally support that. But a lot of these models have used like giant data sets like the, like the web to do their training on. We don't have giant data sets like that of clinical data that are all shared and open. So it's a conundrum. How do we train uh, for a medical model like a ChatGPT model 
when we are necessarily keeping our data separate, firewalled, and private. So I think that's one big risk. We're going to say we can do whatever they did in the regular World Wide Web. We can do that in healthcare, but we can't. We're a siloed, federated data uh, only for the um, nece minimally necessary use is what we share. Hmm. And Will, anything to share from a CMS perspective? Anything on that one? Yeah, I mean, not from a CMS perspective. So, you know, block the, the CMS there. Just from, a, from a, <laughs> anyone, that's, anyone that's, that's used ChatGPT, and, and I encourage folks that haven't to, to you can, I'm not, I don't work for OpenAI. Um, it's just interesting to see the examples. One of the things that strikes me about it is the confidence in which the outputs are stated by the model. Um, and and then you, in the, I, I, anyone, there's tons of examples. You find mistakes where it didn't really it cited the wrong, a, a non existent article or, and you point it out and it says, oh yeah, sorry, I made a mistake. And then it'll say, reiterate it again without the mistake, but with the same level of confidence. I think it's really important. I think from a trust perspective, we will start to trust these models over time because they will speak with confidence because they're not, they're, they're trained to speak with confidence. They don't have a notion of human fallibility and, and humility. Uh, and that's, that's really scary and damaging potentially, right? Because they're not, we don't know, to Kevin's point, we don't know what they're trained on. We don't know if it's actually right. But it's it's acting like it's right, and it's very it's grammar and it's almost perfect. And I think that's gonna be something that's really be on the lookout for is just how we deal with a trust and and that that aspect of of, of these large language models. Yeah, you do, well, you just made me think. I've been asked before. Some of us may remember the Will Smith movie I Robot, <laughs> and I've had folks ask, "Hey, Mike, how far are we away from I Robot?" <laughs> and my answer is, no, nah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know. Um, hey, Elliot, I, wanna, I want you to start with the answer on this one. I've actually been asked this question before. Um, so understanding that race is a social construct. And in some ways, um, gender as well, or say male, female, say very binary, male, female for sex. And we know there, or we now understand and appreciate sexual orientation as well as other categories associated with sex. Elliot, understanding that and appreciating that now the way that we do, do you think doing away with the collection of these bias tendency element, elements, such as race and gender, could lessen unintended bias. Can you rephrase that last part? <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Do you think it could be helpful if we did away with the collection of race based on the categories that we have and sex in a very binary way that we have. Do you think if I we did away with those, away with maybe that. came up with a different structure uh, that was more fluid, could that lessen unintended bias? Do you think they contribute that much to bias? So this is the thing, this is a hard question, I feel, because there are elements that we may want to capture certain data elements such as what race or ethnicity due to those diseases that are associated with specific races and populations. We may also want to identify certain, certain conditions and symptoms that may be noticeable or non-present in a female versus a male patient because of the way they're made, the way, you know, like, I think it's important to not do away with that data, but to store it and ensure that any models that we're using to generate over all data sets are equally representative on different conditions. That's what I believe. Thank you, thank you. Kevin or Will, anything to add to that? I might just, I think this is a very complicated topic and I, I don't think I'm prepared to answer this in a robust way. Um, I, what I would note is for folks that aren't following, this isn't a CMS, this is more an OMB and a Census Bureau. But they're in the process of updating the census and OMB um, 
categories for race and ethnicity right now. And it's a very public process. And there's, and I've actually been on one of the webinars and listening to folks talk about what's important to them and how they think of themselves um, across these different categories has been really enlightening. And I think that would be a good place to start. It's just hearing how people identify themselves. Um, I don't have an answer and what should, what should be right. And we have to structure it in some way. I know that and map it to link codes and et cetera, all that stuff. But I think it, it's a deeply personal um, issue. And I, I, I think it's playing out right now in real time. So for, if folks that are interested, I think it would uh, can engage with that process. Yeah, my thought here is kind of a philosophic one. So we are often asked to put ourselves into a category, male, female, black, white, rural, urban, but most of us, it's not that sharp. Like the categories are all human created categories. And many of us for many different dimensions are somewhere on a, a gradient and on a spectrum. It's a continuous variable. And we have wanted to make those continuous variables dichotomous all over the place. Hypertension, we were just talking about, I was talking about this today on, on AI models. Blood pressure is a continuous variable. Hypertension is a kind of artificial construct to say you cross the threshold after which now we define you as hypertension. And that's moved three times since I've been a doctor. So it's not like a fixed by nature. It's a, it's a human social scientific construct. So my personal thoughts are this terrific kind of data science can let us actually use that gradient continuous variable information rather than forcing us to constantly pigeonhole everybody into a yes, no, this, that, one or two. Let us be this sort of diversity and let's use this big data to actually help figure out where I am on this spectrum, what does that mean for me? And what does that mean for the person next to me who's slightly different on the spectrum, but we're not male or female, black or white. I just wanna make sure we didn't lose Mike. Mike, are you still with us? Um, we'll give Mike just a minute to jump back on here, Kevin, but I did want to tell you, Kevin, they are loving you in the chat room right now. <laughs> <laughs> Getting a lot of love from Larson in the chat room. There you are, Mike. Welcome back. Hey, th th I have no idea what happened. I guess the, the, the uh, bot didn't like my question, so it threw me <laughs> off. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Emma, are there because it's not showing me any additional questions? No problem. I can just um, run through some of these for you if you'd like. Um, one of the questions that came up from Kathy Bryan was, what is the risk to patient care and outcomes that concerns you the most about uh, the integration of AI and ML and clinical medicine? Mike, whoever you want to pitch that one to. Any of the panels, anyone want to take a first stab at that? I think it's that we'll get ahead of our skis. I think, you know, we're going to jump to the self-driving car rather than do lane assist first. And I want lane assist. I want the gentle little nudge. Hey, you might kind of pay attention over here and have my AI ML do that. There's so much interest in the big splash, big bang, like go all the way. Um, uh, but I, I hope we can increment our way there and do it safely rather than saying, oh, here's the tool that will diagnose every condition. It's the magic Star Trek device. Um, maybe we'll get there. I, I don't want that yet. I want lane assist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's a, uh, a question that came in that speaks directly to what you just said, Kevin. And it says, if physicians already don't trust clinical decision support, and quality measures in part, because they sometimes aren't accurate and don't fire correctly, why should we trust AI? It mm -hmm. speaks directly. So you, it, it's gonna be an acquired taste that is gonna happen over time as the accuracy and trust of the accuracy mm -hmm. happens over time, hopefully happens mm -hmm. over time. Hopefully happens over time. Um, the, the other risk Mike here from a, an equity standpoint, is that we'll overtrust our models and we'll reinforce the inequities, kind of like to that example of mortgages. You know, if we've been delivering biased or inequitable healthcare and our learning systems just reproduce that bias because 
they don't have an additional filter that says, you know, I'm being racist. Um, that can just subtly enter into our systems. And with that, we really have to watch for that and build lots of, of ways to look for it and, and, and with multiple test approaches. Very good, very good. Well, I, I'd like to use the last uh, remaining minutes. I'm gonna ask each of you for some final comments for the group, 30, 45 seconds from each of you, final comments. We're gonna start ladies first, just as we began the conversation. Elia, final comments from you. It's great to be here. I think that we have a lot of work to do together collaboratively, that we should definitely maintain visibility, transparency with the patients that we're working with and with any of the, anyone that we're collaborating with so that there could be this added trust. Um, it's very important throughout all the systems that we're building. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for contributing your time and expertise this afternoon. Will, final comments for the good of the group. First of all, thank you for having me. This was a fantastic conversation. Um, and I think to me, one of the takeaways or one of the running themes here is this notion of trust um, and, and getting towards trust and how we do that. And I think it, it's complicated, it's multimodal, it's heterogeneous. I mean, it's all it's all these hard, <laughs> hard things, but aiming for that, I think is a good, a good, a good, uh, good path. And I just look forward to this conversation unfolding as more and more of these tools become available and it really becomes part, potentially part of how we deliver and manage patients in healthcare. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will, for all you do and your colleagues at CMMI. Really appreciate it. Kevin, bring us home. Yeah, again, thank you. This was great. Terrific meeting uh, peers that are also focused on this. Um, I'm bullish about machine learning. We have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of medical decision-making that's not based on statistics or science or data. We have a lot of opportunity here. I want Lean Assist to help me. Um, so I'm, I'm bullish about that. Um, I think our call to action is how do we make this less black box and how do we bring in uh, diverse voices in a consistent way to help us think through these challenges, which are, to Will's point, not technical challenges. These are social challenges. These are trust challenges. Excellent. Panelists, thank you for your time and your expertise and sharing of it with today's group. Jen, I'll turn it over uh, to you and the group. Yeah, a huge thank you to you, Mike. I mean, probably the best moderated um, webinar I've seen. <laughs> Wonderful oh, job. You. And folks, what a great audience. You were so engaged. If you have any comments for us about the program, please stick them in the chat before you sign off so we know what you thought of today's program. Uh, the CEU credits are up there on the screen as well, and, and we'll send that out. But we'd love your feedback on what you thought about the program today and the speaker. So go ahead and pop that in before you log off if you could. Um, big thank you to everybody. Big thank you to UHG for supporting the program today. What a spectacular conversation. Um, everybody have a wonderful day and thank you again for joining us. Stay well. Thank you.